So thank you um, for joining us today for the Paradigm Shift Conference. My pleasure. Andrew Harvey is founder and director of the Institute of Sacred Activism. He is a leader in the sacred activism movement. He has inspired people throughout the world in being able to transform compassion in action, which is born of a fusion of deep spiritual knowledge, courage, love and passion and wise radical action in the world. He's an author of, I think, uh, more than 10 books. 30. He's been a, 30, sorry, oh my, but, yeah, my gosh. And, and incredibly well. Because God knows I'm still here. After oh my while. goodness, oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no. Incredibly well-known, world-renowned, mystical author. And we we've spoken with you before. We've interviewed you, and we love you. We loved your. We love your passion. We really do. We're so yes, glad yes. to have you. T with last time, you were talking about sacred activism and coming from the heart, heart-based intention. And, and I just we're so grateful and appreciate to have you? you on this conference. Where are you in the world. We are in Australia, the land oh, down under. In Australia, I wish I could yes. come back soon. I'm hope I've been there many times, you know. Okay. Yeah. Are you waking up in Australia, or are you still? We've been awake all night. <laughs> we started at three o'clock in the morning. So it's about <laughs> seven o'clock in the morning now, and we're still going strong. But and so Andrew, whereabouts are you? I'm in Chicago, where I in live. Chicago. I live okay. Oh, yeah. And you just got back from France, I understand. Oh my God, bits of me got back. I had the most amazing time. We have started a Chartres Mystery School and then we had a week there and then we went to Andalusia where we plunged into that amazing moment when Islam and Judaism and Christianity loved each other and co-fertilized each other and created works of great mystical beauty and wow. great architectural and artistic beauty. So it was a huge revelation to me. Wow. Amazing. And I love flamenco, so I got into the caves of Granada and saw these three wild women enact sacred activism in dance. My God, if the energy yes. in that room wow. could be canalized to transform the planet, we wouldn't have any more problems. Oh my but goodness. Passion, 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 passion. Amazing. I can't wait to hear more about it. That's um, right. We're just so but what we did want to ask, what we're asking all of our speakers is to start off with perhaps, you know, the theme is the Paradigm Shift Conference. And we wanted to ask you what you see as a paradigm shift and how mm -hmm. you would suggest people what people do to enable them to go through the paradigm shift and find their role in this changing time in the world? That is the key question. And I just finished a book called Savage Grace about this oh. time. And in this book, okay. I really go into the ancient teachings about Kali and Kali Yuga. And in the ancient texts, Kali's dance, the dance of the dark feminine, the destroyer creator, goes through four phases. The first phase is ominous, when she's starting to get wild and angry. The second stage is dangerous, when you're really, really, really seeing what she's up to and that she's really hungry to destroy all the false structures. The third stage is severe, when the crises erupt on every level and in every realm, personally and impersonally, emotionally, spiritually, socially, politically. And the fourth stage is lethal when she destroys the whole thing. We are, I believe, in the severe stage. This is a very severe, terrifying crisis. It's a crisis of the deep spirit, the lack of conscience, the lack of real connection with the sacred that so many people are being dissociated by, the political crisis in America, which is throwing the world into ferment, the madness in the Middle East, the madness in North Korea, the ambitions of China to take over the world, the incredibly difficult and collapsing environment, and the fact that still so many people who should be awake are in la la land in some kind of fake spirituality which is all about themselves and nothing to do with the genocide of the animals nothing to do with the horror of what's afflicting the poor nothing to do with unraveling these structures that are now part of a death machine which is really seriously threatening the future of the human race and a great deal of nature that's where we are and i think it's time for people to really 
see and stop pretending and stop being stuck in their fancy denial or in their fancy lifestyles or in their hunger to manifest Malibu mansions or whatever bullshit that they've inherited from the so-called very unknown new age. So that's the crisis. Even a terrible crisis like this, which we may not get through, there's no certainty that we're going to get through this. The news is bad. And as yet, there aren't nearly enough people mobilized in the right way to begin to begin to deal with the crisis. If we look, however, without any kind of denial, we can see that what the real meaning of this crisis is, is that it is a massive wake up call to the entire human race to get real about the devastating systems we live in and we keep going by our collusive choices and to get real about claiming our deep divine identity, which is real, which the mystics of all situations and traditions know, and really start putting that into action together. There is no other way out for the human race now. You know that by 220, two thirds of wildlife will be gone. You know that by 2049, there'll be potentially no fish in the sea. You know that the collapse of the environment is going much faster than even the doomsayers predicted. There's a huge slab of ice that has just erupted off Antarctica and that is melting. And you know that we currently have in political power the most reactionary, the most regressive, the most drunk on power, the stupidest, the most vulgar, the most violent group of people. <laughs> yeah. mm. This is not looking good, but it's <laughs> in these extreme situations, yeah. if people wake up, that the divine can show us who we really are, what we can really be, and what we can really do. So the book that I've just written is really a, a savage bitch slap and in one sense, but it's also an invitation in the other. It's an invitation to truly understand that the spiritual path is not about only achieving your own liberation, your own happiness, your own peace of mind, your own illumination. That's actually 101. You need those and you need to do the work to get there. But if you're on an authentic spiritual path, what you're going to have to do especially in a world like this, is to put your wisdom and your love and your realization into wise, focused, radical action with other people to get real about a real world that is really facing real extinction. Otherwise, you're just playing pat a cake in a sandpit. You're just chatting, 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 throwing around inspiring ideas, which is fun, but is nothing to do with what's really happening. So that's my position. That's, uh, that's really sad as it is. Yep, that's very passionate coming. too old and too sad and too wild and too inspired to do anything else. I don't think there's any point anymore in sugarcoating the situation. It doesn't help people and it's not loving. Real love is about ferocity as well as mm -hmm. generosity and compassion. And real compassion has a very fierce side. So I believe that the true role of the spiritual teacher is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, not out of hatred or outrage, but out of the desire to really get people who have the money, who have the power, who have the realization partly, to get off their cushions and get out of their comfort zones and start feeling the heartbreak and agony and genocide and torture and madness and injustice of the world and start truly, truly, truly trying to do something. Realizing how late it is and realizing what enormous demands the situation places on us, but realizing too that divine grace is with us and is in the agony of the situation. Your previous guest, which I called the last part of, talked about how important it is to embrace the dark. Well, the dark is our friend in this situation because the growing darkness is being sent by God to show us what is going to happen if we don't change. And evolutionary change doesn't come sweetly. It doesn't just come in an ordered, sweet, organized fashion. Evolutionary shifts always occur through convulsions enormous crises in which 
a lot of people, a lot of members of the species die out. We are facing massive heartbreak, massive difficulty on every level. So we've got to get prepared. And the way you get prepared is by going deep into oneself, discovering the divine strength that lives within you, really doing the practices wisely and profoundly, and really committing the whole of your life to be one of the birthers of a new world that is struggling to be born. That's it. If you're not doing that, you're collaborating with the darkness and you're collaborating with a system that is clearly bankrupt and now on the verge of being both suicidal and matricidal. Am I making myself clear? <laughs> That's very, very powerful and very, yeah. very clear. I, I, you're not mincing words. Um, oh God, and, why should I mince words? I can say what I want at this stage of my life. I have to. I'm not one of those teachers who needs to be flattered or to be loved. I've produced 30 books at the highest level I'm capable of. And I've known for 30 years that we were heading towards this. I've been saying this for 30 years. 15 years ago, they said I was mad. Now they're all ringing me to appear on their programs because I have seen this. And seeing this has nearly driven me mad and nearly driven me not to want to be on the earth at all. So, but I'm here and I'm happier than I've ever been and I'm more purposeful than I've ever been and I'm more committed to really telling it as it is than I've ever been. Because quite honestly, I don't care what people think. What I care about is how people can be got to feel so that they can go through the transformation that will make them useful, transformative, agents of change in a world that if millions of us don't turn up like this we will lose the world and we will lose nature and we will lose this fabulous and gorgeous theater that we've come to and, and you're echoing exactly what bruce lipton said when he first started out this conference um, about the sixth mass extinction of the planet and he, he's well he's quite... to realize that uh, because for many years he was saying that I was too extreme. In fact, he once accused me of being a terrorist, but he did a point. And I'm a tremendous <laughs> work. But it's amazing how many of the um, light ones uh, 10 years ago finally acknowledged it. So I'm very glad that he's saying it at last, mm -hmm. because it's time that all the teachers get out of their metaphysical cloud down on the real earth and see the pain and see the horror and start mobilizing people to do something real about it. Mm -hmm. And, and in saying that, I mean, you're, you're also very inspiring. And I know when we've talked with you in the past, you that also talk inspiring. about... That's not also. Right? It's very inspiring when somebody tells the truth because then yes. you have a chance to react to it. Don't go into that dualism. Don't make somebody who gives the bad news. Don't demonize them because they are inspiring. I'm not just giving bad news. I've spent my life offering different possible solutions, different ways, different modalities. That's what I do. But those modalities are not things we play with. They're not mm -hmm. things we entertain emotionally and mentally. They're things we need, like oxygen. That's what's inspiring. What's really inspiring is that we're divine and we have the capacity to change. But we will not change unless we have a real map of the real path, unless we're prepared to suffer and die into truth and love. That's the way that's always been charted by the great mystics. It has nothing to do with the soppy, vulgar sentimentality of New Age mysticism, which is a disgrace mm -hmm. and real corporate inspired folly, which keeps people absolutely in a fake serenity when everything is at stake. That isn't inspiring, that's garbage. Mm -hmm. I'm not preaching garbage, I'm giving the truth as I see it, and I'm giving solutions. What I'm doing is urging people to get real, get down and get going that's inspiring it is that's very yeah. true and the truth that you, you need to speak the truth with conviction as you're doing it, but you've said it in many different ways i've heard oh, you speak God, in I many think, different yeah. you know you very little effect i might say because <laughs> here we are in a situation where people are still following the old garbage I mean, I cannot tell you how polluted the spiritual world is by materialism, by narcissism, and by false mysticism at a time when we really do need the real path more than anything. So, so I, Andrew, yes, do you see any hope? What do, you, do you see any hope? Of course. When you talk about... Yeah. Do, yeah. I see hope in three ways. I see hope in the fundamental way that we are divine, like that's I know. 
Pythagoras said, take courage for human nature is divine. If we're divine, then we have incredible resources which we're not tapping. And if we can tap them, who knows? Miracles could happen. That's the first hope. The second hope I see is paradoxically in the extremity of the crisis, because if you're not awake now to how terrible it is, in about two weeks or three months or next year, you will wake up and you'll either go crazy because you haven't been preparing for it and you've lived a frivolous life, or you'll really knuckle down and realize strengths and passions and truths and vitalities and intensities in you that you never glimpsed you had. I've seen all kinds of selfish, narcissistic people turn into real servants of God through extreme crisis. So that gives me great hope because I know that extreme crisis is here and is going to get more extreme. Yes. And the third reason for my hope is that I have seen in the course of my 20 years going around the planet, talking to people, begging people to wake up, that a few people, and there's only a few doing the real work at the moment, have turned up and they've turned up in every realm in every part of society and they've risked their jobs their lives their families their minds their hearts and they're doing heroic amazing unpaid unregarded work for the sheer gorgeous love of god and the sheer gorgeous love of humanity and those people I bow to and I salute and I do whatever I can to encourage and help and they, my God, do they give me hope. And I see hope in the tremendous resistance that, for example, is happening in America at this moment. When Trump, this psychopath that America has chosen to elect, and he's a psychopath, don't wince, this man is crazy, he's our crazy, he's the shadow incarnate, but he's dangerous and deeply, deeply destructive and the forces that elected him are the forces that are aligned with the dark that could destroy the planet. So that's what we're looking at. But what we're also looking at, and this is what is hopeful, is an immense uprising of ordinary people who are outraged at what he wants to do with healthcare, outraged at his withdrawal from the Paris Accord, outraged at his misogyny, outraged at his obvious, obvious naked corruption, and who are coming together from all parts of America to really start focusing on building a nonviolent resistance movement that in the end will impeach him and will try and establish in the chaos that he has created the order that could protect just possibly the emergence of a new planet. This is amazing, and they're amazing people. And they give me hope. Not a lot of them are so-called spiritual people, which is what is dispiriting. Fair enough. We have spiritual activists, there's spiritual warriors. We've uh, interviewed one recently, um, one of the biggest. Um, you probably know his name, but we're going to let that uh, come up another time. But um, I know exactly what you're talking about. And certainly positive thoughts, I don't believe, change reality. They're the foundation. But po positive thoughts followed by positive action certainly does a lot in 3D reality. Well, positive thoughts are very helpful, but you've also got to be able to really call things as they are. Positive thoughts in the face of denial of evil isn't going to help at all. You've got to be able to see the dark for what it is. And this movement that we're in is pathetically incapable of really naming darkness and naming darkness as part of God. We've got this fancy sentimental vision of God as this pure light. That's not true. God is the absolute light, but he's working with these terrifying opposites in reality. And one of the opposites is real darkness, which we're all susceptible to and all seducible by. So positive thoughts are not going to get you through the horror of what's happening. You've got to have on the one side a very clear mind about what's really happening You've got to have what Jesus called the wisdom of the serpent, which means a wisdom about the shadow. And you have to have the innocence of the dove, which is the positive, luminous, loving, compassionate intelligence. And they have to come together. I, I think that's what I meant when I said inspiring. When I said you've been inspiring in the past, what I meant is you, you've got this opposite. You've got these two different ways of coming at the same issue. And, and it balances out very well because you're speaking with conviction. But you're also, I've heard you, you know, I think you understand what I'm saying. Yes, I do. But I, you see, yes. to me, what's inspiring. When I, I know. 
the people who inspire me are not the people I know speak in soft voices and smile sure. and talk about having positive thoughts and the power of positive thoughts. They don't inspire me at all because I know that they're semi-psychotic. They don't realize what's really going on. You might when say deluded. And Jane Goodall gets up and talks about the genocide of the animals, makes mm. us feel the pain of that, and then by her example and by her presence and by her solutions, gives us a way through. Absolutely. That inspires me about the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama inspires me about the glory of the presence. But the Dalai Lama said to me, last Two years ago, he said, the human race is on the brink of extinction. What are we going to do? We're going to have to transform ourselves and we're going to have to act. Mm -hmm. To me, that's inspiring mm -hmm. because I'm not being Absolutely. lied to. I don't like being lied to. It's disgusting. It's degrading. I want to be told the truth. And I want to be told the truth in such a way I can get it. And I want then the person who's telling the truth to show me by the presence that they have that they can face the truth and that they can really find a way out. Now, that's inspiring. Mm -hmm. do you know thank that, you for that I do I absolutely do thank you so much for that that's I mean yes yeah, absolutely uh, Andrew tell us what would you suggest the people do I know that you've no, talked before let's about let's not people. start there you see that's the question that belongs to a limited consciousness it's always in our culture what do we do as if everything could be solved by doing by a fix mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. a solution the first thing that we need to be able to do is to suffer the extremity of where we are and let that suffering overwhelm us and really shake the foundations of our smugness our complacency our addiction to comfort our narcissism that's the first thing because without that, we will never have a hope of being real, ever, 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 ever. And actually allowing yourself to be overwhelmed in that way is terrifying, especially when you are like you two are clearly loving people who love animals, who love the world. Why would you do the work you do? Why would I do the work we do? And to actually face the fact that we're in a world in which all of the major institutions, the religions, the political structures, the economic structures have been taken over by the forces of darkness who are implacably wedded to power and not to love and who are prepared to do almost anything to hold on to their power, including ignoring the advice of 98% of the world's scientists, right? When you see the madness like that, mm. it overwhelms you. It has to overwhelm you. And you're stupid if you're not overwhelmed. You're not real until you're shattered. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that you really need to take seriously the testimony of all the world's great mystics. And that testimony has three sides. It has the side that absolutely essential is the first side which says you are divine in your inmost nature you were born with an original blessing that is divine consciousness whatever however crazy you seem to be and however wild and dark your life and however terrible the world there is a divine being inside you waiting to be connected to the second thing that the mystical traditions tell us is that you can connect to that divine being because that divine be that divine loves you madly and wants to make contact and all you have to do is to do some serious mystical practice and amazing things will start to happen to you and the third thing they tell us is that once that has begun to happen don't wait around start serving passionately start pouring your gifts out whatever they are you have gifts of doing what you do i have gifts of doing what i do we're meant to just pour it out in service of divine love and we'll be changed and we'll change others around us. And the rest is up to God, quite honestly, because you can be Kafka, the Dalai Lama, Jesus, Muhammad, rolled into one and pour out your whole life. And if it isn't the will of God, it won't happen. Nothing will happen in the end. But nevertheless, you will have helped people. So those three things are essential to really connect with. So the feeling deeply, the being overwhelmed, no, and then finding... You have to be... Oh, I'm sorry to cut you. I'm really... I'm trying to get something across because we're not playing pat a cake now. You will not be able to find your way to any real solution if you don't first allow yourself to be overwhelmed. Because otherwise you'd just be saying, oh, well, 
if we all pray together in a nice little place, perhaps in no when we've had a nice dinner, a vegetarian dinner, naturally gluten-free, and the vibrations will go out across the earth and there'll be world peace. No, there won't. There won't be world peace because you're not seeing the situation. Mm. So first you have to be overwhelmed to the point of real radical despair where all your structures, mm. including the ones you've created about the divine, collapse. That's when you get really open to grace. And then you have to do the inner work. So we have to start with radical undoing of our conventional ways of being on every level before we can even begin to be able to find through grace any kind of solution. Because any kind of solution born out of a false consciousness will be so much straw thrown into a hurricane. It won't work. It might make us feel good for an afternoon or a month. It might make us a famous guru, but it won't do anything for the real world. And this is absolutely true from one mystic to another, which I don't, the mis title mystic doesn't actually mean much to me anyhow, but it's just a title that I'm using for my belief oh, system. But everything you say is absolutely true. I've, I've gone through my dark night of the soul, my personal paradigm shift, and, and I can tell you, do not turn away from your shadow self, your inner demons, the dark side of your thoughts and your feelings and your belief systems because once you do that your fear will be gone and you will become the spiritual warrior that you are meant to be and you will speak with the truth and you will not have any fear because I experienced my spiritual death I didn't die mortally many years ago before I came to Australia but I was reborn I came out the other end of the light I experienced something that was indescribable and I came back and I joined Lana and as you said here I am here you are and yes it's very true we're doing this because we want to we That's don't get paid for this we've never gotten paid for anything we've done up to this point and i don't we only do it because we want to and we, we're so grateful to have you with us to say everything that you've said and we love you for that i mean we well, just thank you and i appreciate you you're saying because i love you for your service it's quite clear to me, looking at you both, that you're very sincere people. And I can see that you're, I know that I wouldn't, I've got so many obligations. Why would I come out to talk to you if I didn't trust you? I wouldn't. I don't spend my time anymore on anything that I don't believe in. And I believe in what you're doing. And that's exactly what Bruce Lipton said, the same exact words. And we just oh, appreciate you so much for being here after your long trip. And No, God, are you kidding? No. Anybody who's trying to bring sanity to Australia, for example, is a friend of mine. How do you deal with the coma in Australia, the fantastic um, hedonism and materialism and lack of concern for the outside world? That's what always amazes me about Australia, this gorgeous paradise inhabited by people largely who refuse to wake up to the fact that they're connected with the rest of the world and that they, their own government is doing horrific things, for example, to the indigenous Australians and to the refugees. It's a, it's a very strange place, I find, and I love it deeply. How do you deal with it? It's hard. <laughs> we, it is hard to deal we with We try this. to just... Kind of be the spiritual warrior we, you know we have you have to have resilience and you just keep on and we do what we do and we connect with people like yourself and we continue to live strongly and live powerfully as best we can and we encourage everyone to do that we try to empower others and as we empower others we're, we're empowering ourselves and That's we're good. continuing to try to live as we speak and we're connecting and we're trying to do this and using everything that we have and everything that we know to, to just do what we feel we we've been born to do or, or what we've been given our mission I, I don't know how to explain it, it that's it it's not easy I like, it's, it's not easy question because I wanted you gave a beautiful answer for everybody Thank listening Thank that you. was beautiful I think what I would only thing that I would add to it, and this is really an offering to everybody listening who might be asking the question, what can I really do? He's asked me to be overwhelmed and he's asked me to go into a medic, real mystical transformation to connect with the divine strength within me. But there's one more step that I think is very important. And that is to look at the world and realize you're not being called to 
save the whole world single-handedly. This is not an Errol Flynn film you're starring in. You're a limited human being with divine capacities. We all are. The Dalai Lama himself cannot save this planet, right? None of us can, if it's going to go into suicidal self-destruction, which it might. But when you really begin to connect with your divine self, there's a question that you can ask which will reveal your mission. And that question I found is this, what of all of the causes in the world that really distress me breaks my heart the most? This is a terrifying question, because if you really ask that question to yourself, you'll uncover a part of yourself that is absolutely agonized and heartbroken about one thing in particular. When I asked that question, I was told that by a very beautiful old woman in Benares, an old tantric. She said, if you want to help people ask this question, she was 90. And I, first of all, sat by the Ganges and asked it to myself. And I went through all the things that I was heartbroken about, and I thought I'd come to a solution. The next day I was reading the paper, and it was the Times, actually, I found it in, <laughs> in Benares, and I came across an article about the torture of animals. And in a, in a, in, in, in an abattoir and I didn't want to read it and I flipped the page and suddenly I realized that I, the fact that I didn't want to read it is because that's what breaks my heart in a million pieces the horrific torture and savage treatment that we are now meeting out to animals and plants, the whole of nature everywhere. We are genocidal maniacs, killing, 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 and in the most brutal and appalling ways. So I would say to you, if you really want to find your mission, find out what almost makes you crazy with heartbreak when you even begin to begin to think about it and then do something real with someone else about it. And what I've done in my work is to create what I call networks of grace, groups of between six to 15 people who meet around a shared passion, a shared heartbreak, and then pool their resources, pool their wisdom, encourage each and inspire each other and do something real. For example, in my own community, um, my wonderful, incredible assistant, well, she's not an assistant, she's my collaborator and deep co-creator, Jill Angelo, has devoted herself to, to living with and healing abused animals. She has 10 animals in a small farmhouse and she's creating this as a model project which is catching fire because somebody had the guts to stand up and do it. Can you imagine having 10 crazy abused animals in your home? She's doing it and she cries every day and they savage each other sometimes and it's heartbreaking but she's not going to give up because she is a flame with passionate desire to be someone who refuses to be part of the genocidal human race in its appalling treatment of animals and to be an example of true true love in action that's what it takes and this is amazing that there are people like her who are doing this work and they change many people's minds. When Jill first started doing her work, her comfortable friends tried to dissuade her, said that she was arrogant, said she was a narcissist, said she was a drama queen. Now they're all supporting her because she stood up and did it. So I advise everybody out there, be overwhelmed, do the practice and find out what your radical heartbreak is and get together with a group of friends and get real and get going and kick ass and be radioactively mischievous and get something done. It's, uh, it's amazing that you talk about the mistreatment of animals. Mm. I remember we became vegan probably about three years ago, three and a half years ago now. And for years I had been concerned about the fact that animals were being mistreated in factory farms. And I, I remember, you know, being confronted with the fact that pigs are, are in horrendous conditions, mm. not being able to move at all. And for years, I had small children that time. I thought, this is too hard for me to do. I want to become vegan, but I'm not sure how to do it. And, you yeah. know, I, I wanted to change and people kept I saying, see. but you need, you need meat, you need meat. <laughs> and then one day on Facebook, there was a, a a small video about um, about some pigs and I thought look I'm going to watch this I know it's going to break my heart 
but I'm going to watch this. So I forced myself to watch it. Mm. And I became overwhelmed. Mm. I wept. It was one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. I wept. I saw the fear and the understanding in the eyes of the pig when it was seeing its fellow fellows mm. being slaughtered and when it realized what fate awaited it. And I knew that I could I would never change, but I forced myself to go through that pain. And the next day I decided I would become vegan. And I forced this upon my children as well, forced them to, to look at look at some videos of of animals being murdered, of chickens being um, squashed. Um, and my daughter became really angry at being threw this plate <laughs> at me. And, and now they're both committed vegans. I think I that. They're committed um, vegans, um, as I am. I love and, you for what you've done. That was so brave of you. Mm, mm. Exactly what they don't tell you to, they tell you not to do. Don't frighten the kids. As if mm. the world that they're going into isn't frightening enough. Mm. How will they ever know what they need to eat? And need? then I, I was. And I was trying to change everybody initially, you know, like a, oh, yeah. <laughs> like a yeah. smoker who'd given up smoking. And, and, and I was very committed to actually changing the world one person at a time. But I had so many knockbacks that now I'm sort of keeping more quiet about it. I'm still vegan and I'm still believing very firmly in it. But I guess I'm not confronting every person we're not an evangelical we, we, no, <laughs> but we are doing this in a different way I, I guess i guess we are we are reaching a larger audience and i just want to people came here in your harvey present but i just want to add oh, one God, thing no, to this what you it's wonderful what you both said i'm so pleased you jumped in it's beautiful because they need to see you too okay. we need to meet each other naked you know it's too late for a cake right true sure. I, I just want to say that you know, Lana is a, is a psychiatrist, a mental health doctor, and, and I'm an investigator. I've worked in the U.S. court system for a, more than 25 years. And, wow. um, oh, my God. In general. So I've worked with, you know, with 50% uh, of my work was in criminal defense. I know I've said this many times. But, and I know many of our presenters are not going to be as real and as upfront as you are about the global issues and about, everything that you've said so far, this is inspiring. And I'll tell you why, because I know, Lana, when, when you're dealing with someone who's going to prison or who's drinking themselves to death and is about to die or they're doing behavior, self-destructive behaviors that you know are going to kill them, it's not compassionate and it's not loving to try to tell that person that it's going to be okay, that they're <laughs> going to be okay. You're being loving by being up front with them and saying, you're sick and you're being self-destructive and you're going to die and you need to do something about this. Don't ask me what you need to do. You need to do something. You need to look inside yourself and figure out what you need to do to improve your situation. And that is inspiring. And you're exactly right. Sometimes I do, I, I caught my, you caught me just you're a nice man and Thank that's you. very dangerous but, uh, <laughs> this is not a time for nice people it's a time for absolutely lucid people who are prepared to really be offensive if necessary to get the truth through because we don't have time we're living on borrowed time we're hanging by a thread only truth can even begin to be salvational at this moment only radical truth and it can be said in many ways it can be said mm. softly but we have to be prepared to say it very fiercely because that's also love as you know mm. i mean yes. I, one of the things that i do is to actually work with prisoners and guys who've been in prison black guys mm. in chicago there are a lot of them who are shoved away and who join gangs I go in and I say, first of all, I say the last thing you want is a overeducated Oxfordian fairy sitting here telling you what to do. They all scream with laughter and we get on from that. We were blood brothers. And then I say to them, I'm not going to bullshit you. You've really, really destroyed your life potentially, but you great people. You're very intelligent people. Let's look at this together. And they 
would despise me if I wasn't like that because they've been through far too much to want the sweet talk. What they want is the real talk because that's what inspires them. And that's where we should be as a civilization. What do we have to cheer ourselves up about? We're creating devastation everywhere. We're electing lunatics. We're allowing horrific practices to continue. We're worshiping at the shrine of a suicidal matricidal capitalism. We're watching the animals disappear, sipping our Chardonnay. And we're mostly pursuing a completely banal narcissistic spirituality, which is not about doing anything. There's not a lot of room for self-congratulation in that. And you need some teachers on the earth who are prepared to say, this is bullshit. This is not worthy of us. And this is extremely dangerous, especially now when there's so little time left. The window's closing and we've got to get through in the next seven or eight years with really substantial shifts on every level which can only be made by people who are both desperate enough and calm enough, both agonized enough and peaceful enough, both ecstatic enough and heartbroken enough to really step up and really do the real work. That's our last hope. And that, to me, is inspiring because I don't, otherwise the teachers that are just go, selling the same old popcorn, they're not inspiring, mm. they're corrupt whores of the dying system. And, and uh, we do have concepts such as, uh, not, not our concepts, but compassionate use of force and protective use of force that Len and I will be talking about on our radio show with guests in the near yes, future. Yes, very difficult subject, that, yeah. because, you know, we... I believe very deeply in non-violence, mm -hmm. but how do we know we won't get to a situation so extreme in which, in which we'll have to employ violence? And if there is violence that needs to be employed, how will it be employed? And by whom? These are questions we have to consider. You couldn't sit around in, the, on, in, an abj in, in a prayer position when the Nazis are taking mm -hmm the Jews, your Jewish neighbors, out. They, a lot of people did that. They just listened to Schubert. Are we going to do that? Are we going to just cultivate our private gardens while people are slaughtered, while the animals are slaughtered? Or are we going to intervene sometimes forcefully? These are very important questions and nobody has the answer. We're going to have to work this out together. If we had the answer, we wouldn't be in this situation. Quite frankly, non-action is just as dangerous or risky as taking an action many times. Non-action is actually allowing the system of corruption to continue. Non-action mm. is a yes to mm. death in this situation, mm. particularly in this case. That, that very powerful, very confronting, and I thank you for being so confronting. Yes, thank you for that. Well, I thank We've, you for allowing me to be, because quite often I go into you know conversations and I realize that there's no chance of truth available, so I play the benign old elder person and I smile and I tell jokes and I smuggle in truth but you've allowed me by your presence and sincerity to be real. Thank you. And I guess in terms of what we do after we are overwhelmed, as you said, we find our passion, we find what breaks our heart the most. Mm. We do the work. And we do something about it. Work. It's the inner work. You can't, the, the kind of action that I'm talking about in sacred activism is an action that's born out of radical spiritual transformation. Mm. A great sage says the truly wise being knows the inaction in action and the action in inaction. So if you truly, truly follow what I'm saying and follow what the Gita is saying, what Jesus is saying, what the prophet is saying, what you'll discover is that if you connect with your deep inner sacred self, you will find that there's enormous dynamic power in that silence. It will not only change you, the prayers that you pray will have an amazing effect on the people you pray it for. Things will change around you just by being in that presence. So that's the action in inaction. And then when you act from that consciousness, you'll be acting in a way that is in alignment with the divine, not just with your personal agenda. And that will have the blessing of the great peace in the great doing. Mm -hmm. So it's this new form of action, which isn't new, but is the, usually was the province of a very few evolved beings, the Lao Tzu's, the Muhammad's, the Jesus's, the great saints, the great prophets, the great shamans. Now that's something we all need to cultivate because that's our only hope. 
And that's the evolutionary shift. We're being pushed by the forces of evolution to go far, far beyond anything that we've ever imagined before, to trust the divine within and to do the work, to have a path revealed to us. But if I came in to you and said, oh, it's the end of the planet potentially, and there are five things we can do right now, I'd be a crazy lunatic. I'd just been some other Californian guru. Mm. That's not how it works. The divine doesn't work like that. The divine shatters you with truth and humbles you and gets you to the place where you're really prepared to do the inner work and then shows you the enormous power within you that's born from that inner work and the enormous responsibility that you have to really act in ways that it will then guide you and inspire you. And if you don't believe me, don't worry. But if you do believe me, try it. I, mean, I, I love I love what you just said, Andrew, about being just being guided by spirit in this paradigm shift. And I want everybody to really internalize that part that you just said because yes. it's it's extremely important that everyone that's listening understand this. It, this is not an interview, and this is very valuable information. It's crucial. Just. It, yes. Obviously, our consciousness is totally incapable of absolving this. We've created yes. a nightmare and it's yes. closing in on us. That should alert us that we can't do anything from this consciousness that wouldn't potentially make it worse. Yes. You can then decide to run out into the road and lie under a truck. That would be inadvisable because there is another way, but it means being shattered, being humbled, doing the inner work, finding out that you have the divine within, and then listening with every cell of your being to the guidance that will come, and it will come in the most astonishing ways. Mm. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the work mm. of the Shakti. This is the work of grace. Mm. So this is the great sacred way through. And it's always been, but now it's the only way through because humanity will be destroyed if it doesn't find this way through. If we don't evolve into an embodied divine humanity, the mother will wipe us up the face of this earth because we are now dangerous to ourselves and every other species and every plant and every fish. And we are lethal. So our only chance is a massive transformation that results in wise divine action guided by God on every level. Okay. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Great well, gratitude you. and appreciation. You. And you, and I hope everybody else gives you a sweeter time, but I hope, of course, mainly that it's not quite as exciting as it's been for me and for all of us. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, much love. God thank bless you me. so much. Bye for now. Goodbye.